all different types of skin colors, hair types, eye colors, heights, body shapes, etc. How do we explain these patterns of diversity? We see when we walk down the street in the city, we travel. How do we explain those patterns? This is really the problem that I have set myself in my career. I'm a human population geneticist, and my grand quest in life is to understand humanity's diversity and all of its myriad forms. I've worked with all of these people all over the world at one point or another. So, um, no, I mean, it's a very personal quest. Put yourself back at the time of the European Age of Exploration. You are, say, on a boat with Captain Cook crashing around the Pacific Ocean. And you come ashore, and there are people living there. And they're somewhat like people you've met before, but a little different. The language is similar, but it's somewhat different than languages you've heard before. They look somewhat like people elsewhere, but they're also unique in their own ways. Why are they living there? How did they get there? And how did they change over time to both resemble other people and diverge from them? This is really the problem that I set myself as a scientist. And so explaining the patterns of diversity is my overarching goal. But like any big overarching goal or quest in science, you can break it down into sub-quests or questions that you can start to chip away at using the tools of science gathering data, formulating hypotheses, coming down on one side or the other. And the first question we can ask ourselves about humanity's incredible diversity is one of origins. Are we, in fact, all related to each other? And if so, how close do we spring from a common source as a species? The second question we can ask is one of journey. So if we do ultimately trace that to a single origin as our species, so we'll see. How do we come to occupy every corner of the globe in the process of generating the patterns of diversity we see today? Questions of origins and journey. Well, the question of origins, as with so many other big questions in biology, seems to have been answered over a century ago by Charles Darwin. So not in his most famous book, The Origin of Species, but perhaps his second most famous book, unless you're fond of earthworms, which was another book. Um, the Descent of Man, published in 1871, he wrote about the similarities between humans and our closest relatives, chimpanzees and gorillas in Africa. And he suggested, based on very little evidence, there was no fossil record to speak of back then, that based on these broad morphological similarities, similarities in body shape and so on, that because chimps and gorillas lived in Africa, maybe our ancestors came from there as well. And it turns out that Darwin was absolutely right. And even though, again, he had no evidence for it at the time, we now know that apes first appear in the fossil record in Africa about 23 million years ago. The genus Proconsul, our oldest African ancestor, first found in Africa 23 million years ago, when Africa was actually disconnected from the rest of the world's land masses. So due to the vagaries of plate tectonics, it's floating around in the Indian Ocean, the Tethys Sea, crunches into the Arabian Peninsula and Asia around 18 million years ago. And at that point, we have the first so-called African Exodus. The ape species that leave at that time, the descendants of this first ape ancestor, Proconsul, the ones that leave and move into Asia around 18 million years ago, ultimately evolved into the gibbons of the orangutans. And the ones that stay on in Africa ultimately become the chimps and the gorillas, and yes, us. So yeah, if you go far enough back in time, we're all an African species, all apes in the world. But that's not really the question I'm asking. I'm not asking about our shared ancestry with apes. Rather, I want to know about our human ancestry, creatures that we would recognize as being more like us if we were to meet them sitting out here in the audience. Where did Homo sapiens as a species originate? Us, humans, humanity. Well, this historically has been approached, again, to the study of fossils, paleoanthropology, going out and digging things up out of the ground, and skulls, leg bones, arm bones, and so on. 
and saying, often the basis of rough shape, morphology, as it's called scientifically, this skull looks a little bit more like my cousin Frank than that does. <laughs> this is where we all came from. This is the missing link. This is our common ancestor. What I would like to suggest, though, is that while paleoanthropology, which I dearly love, and I'm a trustee of the Leakey Foundation, we give you know, millions of dollars a day in grants to fund this kind of research, it's very important. But while paleoanthropology is so important to our understanding of deep past, it provides us only with possibilities about our ancestry. These questions of origins and journey that we're seeking. Paleoanthropology only provides us with possibilities about that past, not the probabilities of direct lines of descent that we really want as scientists. Now, what do I mean by that statement? This is a good example. What you're looking at here are three potential human ancestors from left to right, Homo habilis, or sorry, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, and Aeranthropus boisei, robust Australopithecus. All in come from the same location in northern Kenya. Turkana, discovered actually by the Leakey family, all three of these, and all dating to roughly the same time. So we've got three potential ancestors living in the same place at the same time. That means that not all three could be our direct ancestors. Which one of these individuals did I descend from? I don't know. Possibilities about the past, but not the probabilities about direct lines of descent that we really want. Well, we as geneticists take a slightly different approach to this. Instead of going out and digging things up out of the past and guessing at how they may or may not connect up to the present and to us, we start in the present and we work our way, our way back in time. Because we know with absolute certainty that everybody alive today had parents. And those parents had parents and so on. So it should be possible in principle to build a family tree for everybody alive today. A genealogical approach to the past. Now, genealogy is an incredibly popular hobby, and I'm sure many of you in the audience have built family trees. You may know about your ancestry going back to the 18th century, the 15th century. Some people can even trace their ancestry back to the early days of the first millennium. But ultimately, no matter how well you know that family tree, you hit what the genealogists call a brick wall, a point where the written record runs out, and beyond that, we simply enter this dark and mysterious realm we call history, and that ultimately fades into prehistory. But it turns out we're all carrying inside of ourselves, inside of nearly every cell in our body, what is in effect a written historical document, the story of us, the story of our genealogy, the story of our family tree, carried in our DNA, the human genome. And that's what allows us to see back beyond that brick wall in our genealogical record, back to the very earliest days of our species. Now, quick primer on DNA, for those of you who have not taken molecular genetics recently, <laughs> you know who you are, there will be a quiz at the end. The famous double helix described by Watson and Crick back in 1953, long linear molecule or subunits A, C, G, and T. There are billions of these in the human genome. And this is an effective blueprint to make another version of you. And in every generation, you have to copy it and pass it on to your children. And then ultimately, if you're lucky, they'll pass it on to their grandchildren, or your grandchildren, rather. Now, billions of these A, C, G, and T's, that's a lot of information. If you took all of the DNA out of one tiny, microscopic cell in your body, and you stretch it end to end, it would be about two meters long. Yet it's all packed inside the cell. You can't even see without a microscope. Now, if you took all of the DNA out of every single tiny microscopic cell in your body, and you stretched all of that end to end, it would reach from here to the sun and back hundreds of times. So it's a lot of information, and in every generation, as I said, you have to copy this and pass it on. And it's so important because this is the essence of you. This is the whole point of evolution, passing on your DNA. And so what are you going to do? You're going to be 
very careful as you're copying this to pass it on. But inevitably, just as though you were copying a long book, imagine War and Peace by Tolstoy. Huge book. But imagine 100 volumes of that and copying that by hand. That's what this is comparable to. You have to do that in eight hours, which is what it takes your cells to replicate or copy your DNA. You know, there are proofreading mechanisms built in, but inevitably, what's going to happen as you're copying this long text? You're going to get tired. Spelling this thing, you're going to substitute an I for an E, or a C for a G in the case of DNA. When these happen at the DNA level, they're known as mutations. They occur at a low but measurable rate for around 100 mutations per genome per generation, ticking off like a clock. In fact, we actually call it the molecular clock. And it's what allows us to assess the ages and the timings and all kinds of things that I'm going to tell you about. Now, when these mutations occur, and they get passed on to children, and then grandchildren, and so on, and end up in the population at some frequency, if you share one of these genetic markers, as we call them after they've been there for a while, with another person, you share an ancestor in the past who first had that change in their DNA and passed it on to the two of you. And that's how we connect people up into ever deeper branches of the human family tree. Now, what do these markers look like? These are five people, one, two, three, four, five, who've had the same region of their genome, their DNA, sequence. And it's been lined up. And the first thing you'll notice as you start to read down among these five unrelated individuals is that they are essentially identical. Humans are, it turns out, 99.9% .9 identical. We only differ on average of one in every thousand of these nucleotide positions, the A's, C's, G's, and T's. So it's actually difficult to find these genetic markers that distinguish between unrelated individuals. We're very closely related as a species. But if you look carefully enough, down here in this region, G, 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 A, G, a single letter change from the G, an A. That's an example of a genetic marker. If you share that A with another person, you share an ancestor, the person in the past who first had that change in their DNA and passed it on to the tree. And again, that's how we start to connect people up into ever deeper branches of the human family tree. Now, much of our work throughout the latter part of the 1980s, the 1990s, and even up until 10 years ago or so, was focused largely on these uniparental markers, the markers that are inherited down a purely maternal or paternal line. Mitochondrial DNA tells us about your mother's lineage, going back in time. Everybody has it, but you inherit it from your mother, and she got it from her mother. So it tells you about your mother's, 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 mother's family. The equivalent of the male side is the Y chromosome. It's a piece of DNA that makes men men. It doesn't do that much apart from that. <laughs> it has a handful of genes for determining maleness and secondary sexual characteristics, like refusal to ask for directions when you lost it, <laughs> channel surfing, and <clears throat> But <laughs> essentially, it is a purely male piece of DNA. It tells you about your father's 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 line. And by looking at these and assessing the pattern of genetic markers in people from all over the world and asking a very open-ended question, and certainly for scientists, and scientists are used to focusing in on very narrow things. This is a very broad question. What does the pattern of diversity reveal? What it shows us when we combine these trees, turn them on their side, simplify them, get rid of the extra branches, and just show the really important ones. What it shows us is that the deepest branches in the human family tree are found only in African populations. And because the length of those branches is proportional to the number of those mutational changes that occur, a mutational clock that I mentioned over 100 changes per genome per generation, because the depth of those branches is related to time, what that reveals is that humans have been accumulating diversity in Africa longer than anywhere else. And therefore, that our species originated on the African continent. Within the last 200,000 years, 
That's the shocker. Because think back to 10 minutes ago or so. Darwin suggested via part of back 23 million years, we share a common ancestor in Africa with all of the apes. But this is a common ancestry for our species within the last 200,000 years. And in fact, it's only within the last 60,000 years that our species has started to leave the African continent to populate the rest of the world. 60,000 years, it sounds like a long time, you know, in social media terms. Probably Facebook will be gone by then if we were to fast forward. But 60,000 years in an evolutionary sense is only 2,000 human generations. That's somewhat more approachable. You know, we can all think of things that happened in the last two, three, four generations. It's a little bit of an extension to go back to 2,000, but it's still approachable on a human scale. It's pretty amazing. It's only in the last 2,000 human generations that we have scattered to the wind, populated the entire world, and in the process, generated these patterns of diversity that we see today. It's an amazing story. And this is the story that I've devoted my life to trying to piece together. Um, now, I was lucky enough back in 2001 to get connected to some documentary filmmakers and ended up making a film that aired on PBS in the United States and the National Geographic Channel International, a film called Journey Man. And that was my introduction to National Geographic. Prior to that, I had been an academic. So I got my PhD in population genetics, postdoc, and so on, various universities. And, you know, this was my first foray outside of academia, but it was an amazing experience, the opportunity to tell, using the data we had at that time, the story of how we had exploded out of Africa so recently. But toward the end of the filmmaking process, I had the opportunity to start to talk to National Geographic about what came next. And National Geographic is an amazing organization. It's funded over 10,000 scientific research grants over the last century. Funded Jane Goodall and the Leakey family, Darute Galdikas, who studies orangutans down in Indonesia. And the question they asked me toward the end of 2003 was Dr. Wells, if you could do anything next in your field, what would it be? Because we think this is kind of cool using DNA to track humanity's diversity and migration patterns and anthropology, and like that's kind of in our wheelhouse. If you could do anything next, what would it be? And my response was, sequence the world's DNA. Sample hundreds of thousands or even millions of people around the world, look at entire genomes, when that technology comes online, but literally expand our sampling of human diversity to truly understand the story of how we populated the planet. And that was the genesis of the Genographic Project. We pitched that to IBM. They came on board as our partners to the we had some large foundations involved as well. We have a team of scientists around the world working on this, and we launched it in April of 2005. Now, it had three core components. At its heart, it was a research effort. This was work we were doing in boots on the ground with indigenous and traditional peoples living around the world. I myself have been to many, many, many countries, done a lot of field work, but we had teams of anthropologists and geneticists working with people in their local regions. Now, why are indigenous and traditional people so important to telling this story? Well, it's because, in the case of most of us, our ancestry is a little more mixed up. Our ancestors have moved around a lot re recently. You know, I'll talk about my own, out loud. I'm largely Northern and Western European in ancestry, so my ancestors come from all over that part of the world. I currently live in Austin, Texas. I'm in Panama today. What does my DNA tell you about the ancient history of those regions? Not very much, because I'm a mutt. You know, I've moved around a lot. But there are people who've lived in the same place for a long period of time, for hundreds, thousands, even tens of thousands of years. And they give us a glimpse of those ancestral genetic patterns that allow us to piece together these more ancient historical migratory events. So the field research with indigenous people was a critical part of that. Now, at the same time, when we were planning the project, 
I felt very strongly that it shouldn't just be the story of the world's 200 million, 300 million indigenous people. It's the story of all 7.6 billion humans on Earth today. It's the story of all of us. And so even those of us who are not, quote, indigenous, should be allowed to take part, find out something about our own ancestry, swab our cheeks, send it off anonymously, get a result back in the mail, you know, check it out on the website, but the opportunity to actually figure out something about your own ancestry and participate in the project, which was a new concept at the time. So the public participation component. And the third part, which I felt very, very strongly about, was the legacy fund. This was a way to give something tangible back to the world's indigenous and indigenous people, many of whom are the poorest of the poor in already very poor places. They're often forced to leave behind their ancient villages, their homelands, typically moving to a growing mega city where there are better opportunities. When they do, they lose touch with the old culture of their children, stop speaking the original language, and within a generation or two, that culture has gone extinct. Linguists tell us that of the 6,000 some odd languages spoken around the world today, most of which have never been written down, by the way, of those 6,000 languages, by the end of this century, between Half and 90% will be extinct, gone forever. And again, never written down, literally extinct. We are going through a period of cultural mass extinction that parallels the biodiversity crisis we hear so much about in the news. Now, as a, an anthropologist or a geneticist, someone who studies human diversity, this is a bad thing because we don't have that much going for ourselves biologically. You know, if you think about it, we can't run as fast as a cheetah. We can't fly like a falcon. We don't have warm fur like a snow leopard. But we can invent cultural ways of doing all of those things. Cultural diversity is what really defines us as a species. It's allowed us to be so successful. It's allowed us to expand from a small African population to 7.6 billion people spread around the globe today. It's allowed us to develop technologies that enable us to fly to the moon and Mars and sequence our own genomes. Cultural diversity is our killer app, if you will. It's the thing that really makes us so successful. And when we lose a piece of that cultural diversity, we lose an important part of what it means to be human. So through these grants, the goal was to do something to try and preserve these cultures around the world. Now, there are lots of ways to assess the success of projects. And I'm fast forwarding through a decade of work here, over a decade, in fact. But you know, numbers are one way, and it's certainly one way that we used internally at National Geographic. Now, over 75,000 people ultimately joined the project, representing over a thousand different indigenous populations from every continent. So far, over 60 scientific publications have resulted. We are still working on those. There's still scientific publications coming out. We have built infrastructure in many places around the world where they previously did not have genetic infrastructure. We've trained a generation of graduate students and postdocs to do this work. They've now moved into faculty positions, become principal investigators, and they have access to these samples. And that was always the goal. We didn't want to own them. We didn't want this to be an American project. We wanted it to be a decentralized project where we were essentially training people to do this work and discover things for the future and training people in other regions. Now, the big surprise of the project came not only out of the science. Of course, we discovered new things and we wouldn't have 60 plus scientific publications, but it really came on the public participation side. Now, the day I took the stage, a National Geographic uh, on the stage, headquarters in Washington, D.C., April 13, 2005, I was in the green room waiting to go on. And it was about 10 minutes before my time to step out on the board and talk to everyone. And we had ambassadors and CNN correspondents and BBC correspondents. 20 IBM senior executives in the room, and they were all tapping their fingers and waiting for me to make a mistake. It was really nerve-wracking. But 
while I was pacing around in, in the back, um, the then CEO of National Geographic, a guy named John Fahey, pulled me aside and he said, Spencer, I just have to tell you, and it was private between him and me. He says, we are so excited about this project. It, it's honestly the biggest thing I think the society has ever done. And we're completely behind you, so excited about it. However, <clears throat> this whole public participation thing swapping your cheek and like testing your DNA. Listen, I know consumer behavior. I used to run timeline. I now run National Geographic. They pay me a lot of money to figure out what consumers want. Nobody's ever gonna spend a hundred bucks to test their DNA. <laughs> <laughs> if you sell a thousand of these things in the next few years, you'll be lucky. So really kind of soft pedal that, focus on the science and all the storytelling that's gonna come out. And I said, okay, John, you're on. I will bet you that we'll sell over a thousand of these within the next year. And he's like, okay, you're right. Well, we sold 10,000 on the first day. <laughs> we had 100,000 by the end of that year. And so far we're up to a million, but as you'll see in a minute, it's launched a much bigger industry, which is now a billion dollar industry. People in 140 different countries, places as diverse as Kazakhstan, and Sierra Leone, sold two to Vatican City. <laughs> I, I would love to know who bought them. <laughs> but I would really love to know what the results were. <laughs> um, yeah, so it was it was hugely successful right after that. And, and nobody knew because no one was doing that back in 2005. So 23 me came along two years later, the ancestors a few years after that. But it raised a lot of money, which allowed us to do all the field work we did with the indigenous populations, but also allowed us to give away over two and a half million dollars through the Legacy Fund. So we gave away over 95 grants during that decade-long period, the project to save the Ainobi language in Central Asia. These are people living in the foothills of Tajikistan, the Zerifshan River Valley. And the language they speak is in danger today because it's only spoken by around 1,500 people, most of whom have been moved out of that region due to landslides during the Soviet era and forced relocation more recently, nation building, identity building. They're living in the capital for the most part, Dushanbe. Their kids speak Tajik and Russian, so they're forgetting the original language. But this language is the last remnant of what was once the lingua franca of the Silk Road. If you have been trading goods anywhere from you know, the Caspian Sea all the way over to the ancient Chinese capital of Xi'an, 1,500 years ago, you would have been speaking their language. And so when it goes extinct, we're losing an important insight into that chapter of our history. So we're developing curricula in that language to try and teach the kids that, you know, it's worth preserving. Like most kids, they don't want to speak their parents' language, they want to speak the new language. But if the school curriculum includes it, they will learn it. Um, a project with Aboriginal populations in the Northern Territories of Australia, preserving their song lines, their traditional dances, and the songs they sing along with them, telling us about their version of their history. And the fascinating thing is, those song lines among different Aboriginal groups in Australia, the melodies actually intersect. And it's a way of them to keep track of their history using songs. I mean, remember, this is a pre literate society. If we think about, you know, going back to the time of the Greeks and before, often the bards, the poets, the singers, they were the ones who passed down the oral traditions. They were not written down. Most of human history was lived in a pre-literate way. And so the ancient stories about where these people came from have been preserved through melodies and words and songs. And we can actually see connections between the genetic patterns and the song line patterns. So where certain groups intersect in the melody and the, the words of their songs will tell us something about how they're related genetically. It's fascinating. Um, a project on the Yukon River in southeastern Alaska and the Northwestern Territories, the healing journey, uh, an effort to raise awareness about the environmental issues facing the groups living there, the Tlingit, the Haida, other populations, who rely on the salmon fisheries as essentially their central you know, aspect of their society. 
everything springs from the fish and the migrations of these fish upriver and downriver. And when those fish go away, it's due to environmental re reasons, the society is in danger of collapsing. Something I think that's very relevant today as we all look into the future with um, radical ecosystem changes. A project with the Schwarm um, of Ecuador, who live in the foothills of the Andes, just down the road here, in fact, it's great to, to talk about this just a few miles away from it. But this was one of the largest grants that we funded working with the Missouri Botanical Garden to try and preserve the ethnobotanical knowledge of these people. Now, if you think about humanity spreading around the world for 50, 60,000 years and living in different environments and having to do experiments in each of those environments, trial and error, to learn about the plants that they can use, the animals that they can eat, and stuff that's poisonous, all of that accumulated knowledge is tremendously valuable. And, you know, in the case of the Schwarm, we were literally trying to catalog the extent of their knowledge so they could preserve it for the next generation. And also for the rest of the world, because if you think about drugs who may be prescribed, you go to a physician. And this is something I often bring up when I'm asked, what's a pragmatic reason we're trying to do this? Cultural diversity, that's fine. What does it actually benefit you? Where's the monetary value? Well, if you go to your physician and you're prescribed a drug, roughly 30 to 35% of those ultimately trace back to plant sources. And we typically know about these plant sources because of accumulated traditional knowledge. Now, the ancient Greeks knew that you could boil willow bark and give it to women in childbirth because it would alleviate pain. That ultimately became aspirin. That's a pretty important drug in the industry. But there are so many stories like this. And so the question you have to ask is, if you think about thousands of populations and tens of thousands of years of accumulated wisdom, how many potential treatments for HIV or cancer or whatever the next big pandemic Ebola might we be missing out on by not taking advantage of this knowledge now? We would literally have to go out and recreate it. So why not capture it? Anyway, some examples of things that we found it through the legacy grants. Now, the real shocker that came out of the project, science was awesome. It was wonderful to be able to fund those grants. But I think in terms of social impact, the, the biggest surprise was the excitement on the part of members of the general public in getting their DNA tested. I mean, John Fahey, the CEO of National Geographic, was right. Like, at that point, like, nobody was going to do that. Who cared about testing their DNA? Literally, what did it mean? And now it's, it's a big deal. This whole industry of consumer genomics has exploded. And it's coincided with a radical shift in technology. The cost of DNA sequencing, the cost of accumulating genetic variations, so turning your spit sample or your cheek swab sample into digital information that you can analyze, has dropped so rapidly in the last few years. It is the most rapidly changing technology in human history. The first human genome, the one that was sequenced as part of the Human Genome Project that many of you have probably heard of, that extended from the late 80s up until about 2001, 2002, 2003, so let's say it lasted 15 years. It cost over $3 billion to sequence that first human genome. It is now possible to sequence a human genome for less than $1,000 in less than a day. Literally, the most rapidly changing technology in human history. Effectively, compared to what it cost before, when I was still debating, when I started graduate school, still debating with my professors whether it was theoretically possible to sequence a human genome with the technologies we had at the time. Fast forward 30 years, it's now so easy and so cheap. By the end of this year, we've been promised by the company that makes all the machines that the sequence of DNA on that it's going to be less than $100. So effectively, in comparison to what the first genome cost, it's free now. And when things become free, like this, they become ubiquitous. There are more of these in the world now than there are human beings. And that's, that's what's happening with DNA.
DNA sequencing. And this whole consumer genomics industry that we launched, the geographic, now, this was us way back here, early on, you know, a few hundred thousand people. But then we start getting these effects of talking about the results, we start getting the effects of spending a hundred million dollars on advertising from companies like 23 and the Ancestry. And it explodes. 30 million people have now tested their DNA in the US. And it's an interesting time because we never anticipated that level of consumer interest. I mean, we hoped for 100,000. We dreamt of a million. The 30 million becomes an entirely different entity because when 30 million people have tested their DNA, that's 10% population of the United States, roughly. They're testing not just themselves, but all of their cousins, their parents, their siblings, their children, and grandchildren. Because you live in a web of DNA, because you share DNA with all these people. Everyone in the country now has their DNA in a database, either because they've tested or someone close to them, a relative, has tested. And this raises all sorts of ethical issues, which we're in the process of exploring the nonprofit that Set up. I'm not going to go into that now. Rest assured, this has been an amazing time to be in the consumer genomics business. It's been incredible to see the excitement on the part of members of the general public, non scientists, in figuring out you know, who they are, where they came from. The ancestry is the primary driver of this, and these are the big five. I mean, we picked it off with Genographic, which morphed into Genome 2.0 in 2012. 23andMe was the second major player. Family Tree DNA is a big player on the genealogy side. Ancestry, 2012, they're now the biggest player. 15 million people have tested through um, the Ancestry DNA service. And MyHeritage is a big company that's come out recently in the last couple of years, is making huge inroads in Europe. They're an Israeli-based company. But these are really the big five players in this space. And they account for the 30 million people who have tested. Ancestry sold 1.5 million kits in four days the last two cyber weekends combined. So the period between Thanksgiving Day in the US, which is on a Thursday, so Black Friday, the weekend in between Cyber Monday. These are four day periods when companies really pump out a lot of marketing to sell their products as we head into the holidays. 1.5 million. Think back to what John Fahey said to me before I took the <laughs> last I mean, it's insane. More than 30 million people have tested with all the companies combined. It's over a billion and a half dollars of industry revenue. We anticipate that we were 26 million by the end of last year. We're up to around 30 million now. We're going to be 50 million by the end of this year. It's doubling every year. We should be at 100 million at the end of next year. It's just an insanely rapidly growing industry. Consumer DNA gets the best selling numbers on product category. Both of the last holidays, and everybody you know, in America has a relative, or they themselves have been tested now with one of these companies. It's crazy. Now, one of the things that comes out of this is this tremendous power to see new patterns. This is the whole reason we did this in the first place. It was not because we thought we were going to make money. No one at National Geographic or IBM thought we would ever make any money out of this. They thought it was a way of engaging the general public in the scientific process. That's what I hoped for. You know, I actually believe there might be an industry there as well. I'm not sure that I tend to be optimistic. But the people who you know, funded us to do that, internally in that and IPM, never thought that we would ever see a market like this. But the thing that's come out of it is the tremendous power of these networks not only the size of the database, but also in people's ability to start to analyze their own genetic data. And this is a great example. A woman wrote into the project back in, I think it was 2008 or 2009. She said, listen, I love what you're doing. Lots of members of my extended family have tested themselves. We get together and compare our results at Thanksgiving and other family holidays. I think it's fantastic what you're doing, however, I just have to say, I think in my case, you must have gotten it wrong. You must have mixed up a sample. You may need to retest it because you told me that I'm carrying a Central Asian or a Siberian.
you're really genetic lineage. And I know for a fact that my ancestors came from a little village just outside of Budapest, which is what we have here in Hungary. So I must be Central European, Mitteloy Roda. So somewhere in Hungary, somewhere in that part of the world, you're telling me I'm Asian. Doesn't make any sense. Please retest me, thank you very much. And so when I got this email, I was, you know, a little bit surprised, but also a little bit excited. But not because I enjoy asking the lab to cherry pick one sample out of hundreds of thousands. They don't tend to like that very much. But rather because the Hungarians are a really interesting population, at least linguistically. So if you think about the languages spoken in Europe, think about the language I'm speaking now, English. It's part of what is known as the Indo-European language family. There's a set of closely related languages that descend from a common source within the last six to 8,000 years. So English is a Germanic language. There's some related to Scandinavian languages, Dutch, German. Another branch, which of course we know about here, the Romance languages, Spanish, Italian, French, that's a branch of the Indo-European language family, the Slavic languages spoken in Russia, spoken in parts of the Balkans, Ukraine, etc. Hindi and Sanskrit down in India, they're also Indo-European because of the migrations of Bronze Age steppe nomads about four or five thousand years ago. Farsi is spoken in Iran, part of that same migration through Central Asia. But the point is, most of the languages Essentially, all of them, apart from a couple of outliers, belong to the Indo-European language family. And solving the Indo-European question, figuring out where those languages came from and how they spread, has been one of the major issues in both archaeology and linguistics for the last century. We think we've actually solved it now. But the point that I'm trying to make here is there are a couple of outliers in Europe. One is Basque, spoken in northeastern Spain and southwestern and according to the linguists, it could have come here from Mars. <laughs> it's what's known as a linguistic isolate. It's unrelated to any other spoken language in the world, according to them. It actually has some deep, tenuous connections to ancient Sumerian, which is extinct, and possibly some languages in the Caucasus, which I, I think these are real connections, but they're very, very deep, and a lot of linguists don't recognize it. But that's an isolate. It's often its own. And then there's Hungarian, which is actually part of a different language family. It's not Indo-European, but it's part of the Finno-Ugric branch. So it's related to Finnish, a language spoken by the Sami lap reindeer herders who live in northern Scandinavia. The Finno-Ugric branch of what's known as the Uralic language family. As the term Uralic suggests, the center of diversity is over in Siberia, east of the Ural Mountains. So it's a Siberian language family, and this makes sense because we know from written records that the ancestors of the present day Hungarians, the Magyars, also known as the Huns, that's the name country, migrated out of Central Asia on horseback about a thousand years ago. They conquered this little corner of Central Europe. And they impose their language and their culture and their love of chicken paprikash and all the other stuff that makes you country. Right? All these people actually look back here later because pepper is all in the world. But anyway, so they impose their language. There is a tremendous cultural shift. And when geneticists see something like this, a linguistic replacement, we think, aha, there must be a genetic pattern there as well. And so we go in and we sample 50, 100 people from Hungary. We test their DNA, and they look exactly like the surrounding population. There's no genetic impact from Siberia or Central Asia. But when this woman broke into the project, curious about her own results, I said to my team, let's pull the data. How many people do we have at the moment that have Hungarian ancestry? And it turned out that that would be 2,300 people. So a much bigger sample size. And with that bigger sample size, we were seeing 2 to 3% Siberian or Central Asian lineages in this data set. So it's consistent with that migration of people who brought their language and spread it into Hungary. 
the power of large quantities of data. We kind of expected that when we set out the project. What we did not expect, though, was for this analysis to be driven by a person who wasn't a geneticist, wasn't a scientist at all, was just curious about her own personal genetic result. It's the power of citizen science that enabled people to answer questions about themselves driven by their own curiosity. Multiply that by hundreds of thousands or millions of people, give them the tools, and they will discover amazing things. And so this is a big part of what we have been focused on, both in the Geographic Project and in my own work since then, as we move forward and more and more people get their DNA tested. Now, I want to talk quickly about a couple of revolutions that have happened in this whole business of human population genetics over the last few years. Um, really, kind of since I started to wind down my involvement in geographic in 2014, 2015, um, and moved you know, off to, to my new partner, National Geographic. The first revolution is the revolution in whole genome sequencing. And I mentioned this before, this idea that there's been an earth-shattering change, at least in the scientific terms of that, um, in the ability to sequence DNA. And so, you know, what would have taken 15 years, $3 billion, even 20 years ago, now you can do in less than a day for something approaching $100. There are actually commercial companies that will sell you whole genome sequences for a couple of hundred bucks these days. It's incredible. Um, just unimaginable that I started off in this field back in the 1980s. So this revolution in the whole genome sequencing, driven by advances in technology, microfluidics, and imaging, and all sorts of other stuff that's gone on in you know, combined and creatives. And the other revolution is the revolution in ancient DNA. And this is the one that's so exciting for me as a population geneticist because it is a way of traveling back in time. Ancient DNA is our time machine. Because up until recently, we've been limited to studying the DNA from people alive today. And we all have pretty complex histories. I've talked about mine before. I'm sure you all also have your own complex histories of ancestries and migrations, recent events and ancient events. And so to piece all of those together, statistically, is really complex. What if you could go back in time and test people who were alive, say, 7,000 years ago and compare them to people who were living 5,000 years ago? the same place, would there be a change over time that would correspond to the population movement? What if you could go back to the original hunter-gatherers in Europe and see if they're different from the agriculturists? A big question in archaeology. What if you could start to find other species of humans using DNA and DNA alone? All of this has been possible only in the last few years, and it has literally upended the certainty of the models that we thought we had developed throughout the 90s and the noughts about this recent expansion out of Africa, and people have mostly stayed, but since then, you know, there's been a lot of changes, and a lot of other things walking around on planet Earth apart from us. So I showed you this. The ability to sequence DNA very cheaply opens up the possibility of doing it in a lot of people. And so we can now look at whole genome sequences for entire populations. Literally, some of the papers that are being published these days, a million or more people, a million people with genome sequence in a single statistical analysis. We're discovering amazing stuff, also stuff that raises questions about the extent to which we want to know these things. Um, it's, it's a really interesting time. But for us, it enables us to use tools of genetics that used to be bugs in the system, there used to be things that we didn't like about genomics. The fact that, for instance, most of the chromosomes in the human genome, apart from the X and the Y down here, but most of these 22 pairs of your autosomes, as they're called, come in pairs, you get one from your mother, one from your father, they go through a shuffling process in every generation as they're being passed on to you, and you, in turn, shuffle them as you're passing them on to the next generation. That shuffling process makes it really difficult to build those trees that I showed you. And so there's a reason why we were looking at the Y chromosome, which doesn't go through a shuffling process, because as you can see, it's a tiny little grunt in your 
or if it's part of the X. It doesn't shuffle as a result of that. Mitochondrial DNA, similar idea, it doesn't go through a shuffling process. So we can build those stable trees. And they reveal some details about the earliest events in the history of our species. But most of the genome goes through that shuffling process. We almost thought that was a big pain in the blank. But it turns out that's a feature, not a bug, because you can actually use it to discover really cool stuff. You know, as humans have moved around the world, and the reason we're so diverse today, we have changed over time. Our DNA, although it's very, very similar, there are distinct differences. You know, you don't tend to see people with my hair color and my skin tone in sub-Saharan Africa. People have shifted in the last 60,000 years that they've moved into Northern Europe. And those adaptations can be seen at the genetic level using the tools of modern genomics. So if you think about that shuffling process that I mentioned, the chromosomes actually change bits along their entire length. And you imagine that going on for many, many generations in every population. What you end up with at the end of it is kind of background level of shuffling. So think about this as though these were different colored beads on a necklace that you had inherited. And everybody has kind of a random jumble of different colors in their beaded necklace. And the question we want to ask is, are there sections of these beaded necklaces that you've inherited that are too similar to be accounted for by chance? They're anomalous. They're too similar. There's this background level, but then there's these little sections that look too similar. Well, if this were actually a fashion accessory, you would say it's a trend. Everybody decided that you know, that particular combination of colors is super cool, and everybody decided to go out and add it to their necklace. Well, we can't see those segments of the genome, the shuffled genome, obviously. When we see this at the genetic level, by scanning along the entire genome, we see those segments that are too similar among too many people. What that means is there has been selection for a gene or a genetic variant, more specifically, within that region. And it's been driven to very high frequency. It originates from a single genetic background, and that genetic background gets pulled up, and there's a combination around it. I won't go into the complex mathematics of this, but in essence, when you see that segment of the necklace that's too similar, it's a sign that there has been natural selection active in that region of the genome. And we can now look at hundreds of thousands, millions of people, scan their entire genomes, and all of these peaks are amazing stories about how humans have adapted in our wanderings around the globe. DNA is not simply a passive passenger that tells us about the roots we follow. It tells us how we became who we are today how we changed over time and adapted to high altitudes and low altitudes and tropical forests and deserts and high latitudes and so on. How we adapted to changes in diet. The strongest peak that we see, strongest evidence for selection in the human genome is the lactase gene. This codes for an enzyme that digests the sugar that's found in milk. Now, okay, why is that interesting? Well, Mammals are born with the ability to digest milk. It's one of the things that makes us mammals. And so until we're weaned, in the case of humans, until about two years, we express the gene that allows us to digest the sugar in milk. And then around the time we start to switch to solid food, we lose that ability. The gene shuts down. It's an amazing story in evolution. It's like everything's perfect. Like when we can you know, start to gnaw on food and digest it properly, like the whole sugar digestion thing goes away. But in certain populations in the Middle East, in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, around six to 8,000 years ago, people domesticated sheep, cattle, and goats. And they discovered that you didn't have to kill the animals, I mean, that's a source of protein and fat and calories once. You didn't have to kill them, you could actually milk them. You could make cheese and yogurt and other good stuff. The animals would live for years, and you would have this you know, steady supply of clean calories for you and your kids for many, many years to come. The problem is, as an adult, you can't digest that. I mean, that's part of the reason they started to ferment things, and they made cheese, and they made 
yogurt, and so on. But part of it is also an adaptation of the on the biological level. So one person, six to 7,000 years ago, we think, living in one of those populations that had domesticated sheep, cattle, or goats, one human being that recently had a mutation in their DNA that allowed them to continue to express the lactase gene, the ability to digest the sugar and milk into adult. It's called lactase persistence, or lactose tolerance. So lactose intolerance is the normal part of being I mean, the, literally, the vast majority of the world is lactose intolerant. It's only a few mutant populations that descend from this individual who lived a few thousand years ago who retains that ability into adulthood. But the selection for that was so strong because it was such an amazing adaptation that it's now found at a frequency of nearly 100% in the European populations, where milk has always been the belief that they would die. And you can see that story in this peak right here, because it's got a really strong, easily discernible segment of bees that are identical, if you think back to that previous slide. But there are so many stories like this. That one is in the Cooper's class. They have played a role in being immune to the plague virus, to the plague action. This is involved in skin color, so fairer color coloration in Northern Europe. This is also involved in skin color. This is involved in the immune response. This is involved in fatty acid metabolism. Every single one of these is a story about how our ancestors have adapted to changes in diet, changes in environment, changes in pathogens that we encounter in everyday life. So it's an incredible time to be a human population geneticist and to be able to tell all of these stories. Now, the, the revolution in ancient DNA is one that I'm sure you do heard about it, and the idea that we're all, you know, if you're non African, roughly 2% Neanderthal, and you mix the Neanderthals, that comes out of sequencing actual Neanderthal genomes. DNA from bones, 40, 50, 60,000 years old, typically found in caves in Europe and in Asia, but we can sequence genomes that are that old. It's, it's amazing. We can even find species that we didn't know about before we started sequencing ancient DNA. The Denisovans, found from a pinky bone, a little girl's pinky bone, discovered in a cave in Siberia that was once inhabited by a Russian monk named Denis. That's the name of the cave, Denisova Cave. And so the individuals who lived there, who had this particular genome sequence, are called Denisovans. They're like an Asian, ancestors, or relatives, rather, of Neanderthals. The Neanderthals are mostly found in Europe and in the Middle East. The Denisovans are mostly found in East and Southeast Asia. So they're going to be Asian Neanderthals. We had no idea that this species even existed until we could sequence ancient DNA. It's incredible. So, I mean, the stories that are coming out are awesome. They're fun. They sometimes make it into the popular press. Ozzy turns out to have a high level of Neanderthal. But they also, they reveal poignant insights into how tough life was in the past, and you know, how many things we take for granted these days um, in modern society. Um, the Bronze Age is turning out to have been one of the scariest periods in human history to be alive. You know, this guy down here, what you're looking at here is a trench through the Tel El Sultan, also known as Jericho, the biblical Jericho. It's in the West Bank, Palestine at the moment. Um, but this individual down here is standing in 10,000 BC. So there's 12,000 years of accumulated human history, what we think of as human history. I mean, most people ignore the hunter gatherer stuff. But, you know, once we develop agriculture and cities and laws and written records and so on, like that's history. 12,000 years of human history piling up on top of that. And a big chunk of that, right around here, was the Bronze Age, starting around 3500 BC and extending to around 1200 to 1000 BC um, in most parts of Western Eurasia at least. Turns out to be a really scary time. There were massive population replacements, male mediated population replacements. 
the Neolithic societies, the farming societies, where it was probably women who planted the first seeds because they were the ones who traditionally did the gathering of the gathering groups, and they had to walk further and further as the climate shifted to the end of the last ice age to gather those seeds. They would have been the ones to decide to plant them. The women actually had very high status in most of these early agricultural societies during the Neolithic. And in many cases, women determined group membership, so they were matrilineal and matrilocal. And there were lots of goddess cults. So if you've seen those figurines with the women with the bulbous hips and so on, I mean, that's coming out of this Neolithic tradition, which developed in part of an early gatherer tradition of parts of Europe. But the point is, in the Bronze Age, when people developed weapons, the bronze was not just used for tools. It was used for killing devices. That's the reason the Bronze Age spread so widely, is because they were highly efficient. When you go to those museums in Europe, and the curator is leading you through, and they say, well, you know, these axe heads were largely ceremonial, and these arrowheads, you see tens of thousands of them, they were largely ceremonial. That's BS. <laughs> They were developed and they were created en masse and they were used for killing. And we see massive killing fields throughout Europe at this time. So extreme that using ancient DNA, we can actually detect a tremendous effect in the gene pool. So the best example I like to give is a paper that came out a couple of years ago. The people who built Stonehenge, so they were a Neolithic farming community relatively benign, happy-go-lucky people. They built Stonehenge about 3000 BC. Then a group of Bronze Age warriors from continental Europe, the Beaker people, the Bell Beaker people, arrived in Britain about 2500 BC, so about 500 years after Stonehenge was built. In the 200 year period between 2500 BC and 2300 BC, after they arrived, there was a 90% genetic replacement in Britain. Such that the people who were worshiping at Stonehenge in 2300 BC were essentially genetically unrelated to their ancestors in quotes who had built it a few hundred years before. They were much more closely related to the people living in continental Europe who had moved in, killed them, replaced them genetically. And we can see this in the patterns of variation. This is the Y chromosome in European populations. This little pink band is a tiny depth. So these are all individuals alive today, tracing back in time. So as you go further up here, you go deeper into the past, this little pink band, that tiny depth, is the Bronze Age. All of the men coalesce back to the Bronze Age. That's when men took control of the world. That's when men started kill off people who weren't related to them. That's when we created the societies we have today. The Bronze Age was a scary time. And this is all stuff that's being revealed from ancient DNA. We never really had an inkling of how scary life would have been during that 2000 year period before we had um, ancient DNA. Now I want to end up by talking very quickly about Panama, which is fascinating, and I should have left more time for this mission rocks and the other stuff in my talk. But I do want to talk about Panama as a global melting pot because the history of Panama is so cool, as all of you guys know, because you live here. Now, <laughs> Panama, the isthmus that connects North America to South America. So sea level started to drop about three million years ago. There was uplift in the land. This is part of the, of course, circle of fire, ring of fire. So there's a lot of tectonic stuff going on, but basically the isthmus of Panama connected north to South America forms about three million years ago, and at that point we started to have exchanges of the animals and the plants between those two continents. And the Caribbean becomes separated from the Pacific, and all sorts of things happen in the coral reefs, which is also really, really interesting. But Panama is kind of unique in the world in that sense, because it kind of came up and joined two continents, but also split two seas, and there's a lot of really cool biological diversity that's come out of that. Um, in terms of the initial settlement of Panama by modern humans, that story is, you know, we've known this for a while, that modern humans came out of Africa within the last 50 to 60,000 years, and from East Asia, probably 
region a little bit to the west of there in Siberia, moved across the Bering Dam Bridge during the last ice age. Sea levels were 300 feet lower. People could literally walk across following woolly mammoths into the New World and probably took boats down the west coast and very rapidly made it down to places like Monteverde in Chile. So 515,000 years ago, so very rapidly expand across this, and we were the first hominid species that had ever existed in the Americas. And we literally just took over and exploded hugely successfully. Now, of course, people came along from Europe uh, much later than that, so in the last 500 years or so. Um, these chaps, Balboa, Super cool guy, not only because the main road around the Corniche here, it's named after him, but as you all know, he's the first European ever to make it to the Pacific in the New World. And so he tracked across Panama and saw the Pacific, as they say, for the first time. Um, and Davila, um, somewhat less nice from what I've read. Um, he was one of the governors of the, the first, I think, the first major governor of the first Spanish colony here, and not particularly nice to the the locals when he arrived, but these guys helped to establish that European presence in Panama. And it was a significant presence. Now, we know that there were probably between 200,000 and 2 million Native Americans living here when the Spaniards arrived. Most of them were killed off um, by the, the viruses and the bacteria that the Spanish had brought over with them because there was no innate immunity to those. And so Jared Diamond is really the very famous book about this, Guns, Germs, and Steel. It wasn't just the guns and the steel, the bacteria, the viruses, the pathogens did a lot of the for the, the Europeans when they came in. But these guys were the vanguard of that European migration to this part of the New World around 500 years ago. We, of course, a little bit later than that, add to this the African slave trade, the exodus from Africa, um, driven by slavery, that largely happened in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. And so millions of people being moved from West Africa, and largely, although there were migrations from Southern and even Eastern Africa, although most of these people were later um, traded by the Islamic slave trade, but migrations mostly out of this region of West Africa over to the Americas, a lot of them coming into the Indies, but some of those also coming into Panama. Then, of course, the Panama Canal. When the Americans get involved and they bring in a lot of people from the rest of the Caribbean, um, so not only people of African ancestry, but also people of South Asian ancestry. And so you have you know, people who were brought over by the Brits from their colonies in India and you know, to places like Grenada or wherever it might be, and the Americans brought some of those people over as well as people of African descent. And so this is a huge melting pot in, in Central America. And so it's fascinating to ask, well, what does the DNA look like? And so we've, we've analyzed, um, this is work that's been done by people here in Panama, working with European scientists, not work that I've personally been involved in, but analyzed those male and female lineages that I mentioned before, mitochondrial DNA, the female line of descent, and the Y chromosome, the male line of descent. The story that emerges is fascinating, and it's actually consistent with what we see in other parts of Latin America. The female ancestry is largely Native American. And so if you look at all of these different regions in Panama, the vast majority of people have ancestry on that female side that is Native American. When you look on the male side, however, it's entirely different. The vast majority is either European, Sub-Saharan African. In some regions, it's significantly Native American, so this population up here. But for the most part, it's West Eurasian slash North African, so Spanish, in essence. And again, this is the pattern, and it makes sense. You know, you've got conquistadors, you've got guys coming over here, soldiers in the army, sailors, and what they do is they marry local women, and so you get this mix. This is something we see in other parts of the world. The Icelandic people, a very famous study that was done about 10, 15 years ago, um, they, of course, like to trace their ancestry back to where their language came from. So it's a Scandinavian language. They talk about their Norwegian ancestors who sailed across over a thousand years ago and settled Iceland. 
But it turns out, when you look at their DNA, the Nor Norwegian sailors stopped in Ireland to pick up some girlfriends. <laughs> and they continued out. And so the, the Icelandic people today are a mix of Celtic female lineages, so Irish and Scottish, and Norwegian male lineages. You see this kind of mix in other parts of the world. So this is a story that's kind of emerging. It will be really fascinating to start to look at whole genomes. Now that we, again, have the power to do this. And I know that Alex is spearheading an effort here in Panama to, to sample like 500 people from around the country. So it's going to be very exciting to look at those results and put them into context um, based on the wine we have to do So I'm going to go ahead and end there. Thank you very much. Um, if you're interested in following on social media, we also have a podcast called The Insight. If you're interested in these kinds of stories, um, you can continue to follow along. We release an episode every week. But thank you very much. It's been wonderful.